Hello and welcome to the More Confidence with Luna Guy podcast. I am your host, Luna Gaia, and here we talk all things self-love, body image, self-esteem. We really teach you and show you how to love yourself inside and out. So it's not just something that you strive for, but something that you can live. On today's episode, I am so excited to have this guest on my show. We have Martika Chanel. She has a whole bunch of fancy letters after her name and I had to ask her about it and um and I still don't entirely know that's how fancy they are so please go check her out I'll pop it in the bio anyway when when you check it out but she's a bootstrap founder author speaker which I think are more exciting anyway to be honest and an active community member who believes in giving back through her engaging and transparent speeches she plants seeds of inspiration instilling the importance of perseverance and seeking love from within first duh you can tell she's on my podcast huh Martika is a senior safety consultant in the construction field, interestingly enough, who believes success is in everyone. I love it. As the managing member of Inspiring a Read Book Company, Inspired LLC, she works to foster enthusiasms for reading by publishing stories and messaging that resonate with the youngest of readers and beyond. This is super exciting because what Martika is doing here is sharing, sharing books, sharing knowledge, sharing love about this to kids children's books and I think this is such an important thing that we need to have in our society because imagine if all of us grew up with this rather than have to undo it all in our 20s 30s 50s 70s and beyond her books are available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and her brand new book what to do with these red flags is coming out or uh, September 30 which is just a couple of days before mine comes out on October 1st perfectly imperfect so please welcome to the More Confidence Podcast, Martika Chanel. Hi. Hello. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here, Martika. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Yeah, it's an honor to be here, really. <laughs> I can I can see from your background already. I, I feel like in the corner behind you are a couple of your books. Are they yours? Are they the ones that you have made in the past? Yes, yes. Uh, this the, the first one that you see, I Will Live My Best Life too. This is my debut book. And yeah. this one speaks to perseverance and the importance of having just being self-driven and yeah. what that what that will result in. So if children put in the hard work, they will see the fruits of their labor. So whatever they want to be in life, they can become it. And um, it talks everything in here from um, different types of uh, professions, as well as different places that they can go in the world, room, et cetera. They can go to space if they want to. It's, uh, the sky is theirs. The, the, the world is theirs. The wow. sky is the limit. And, uh, and also the, the importance of self-love as well is also in here. So, yeah. And I love just by looking at the, at the thing there, you know, how much diversity you've put on the front cover there too, that, you know, it, it's, it's for everybody. It's not, it's not a certain type of person, a certain gender, a certain race, a certain religion. It's everybody. But just by looking at your book cover straight away, that's phenomenal. I love yes. it. I love Thank it. You. Yes. And your latest yes. book is coming out September 30. Mm -hmm. which is, you, you know, we're talking 28 days away. That's super exciting. Mm -hmm. Tell me, how did we come? How did we come? How do you come to be here? What has led you to this place where you decided to become an author and inspiring speaker to others to be able to help kids and re re engage readers and inspire readers of all ages? Well, how did you get here? Well, I've always been a writer. I think whenever you hear other authors say that, they'll say that I've been writing, you know, for years. And I used to write poetry, you know, in high school, and I loved uh, English class, all those things, and um, fascinated with punctuation, the M dash versus the N dash, just real nerdy. Oh, <laughs> I love me. it. <laughs> I didn't even know what that means. <laughs> and I love it. I'm like, what is the M dash? It's like learning about the Oxford comma. I'm like, oh. Yes. <laughs> Which I'm nerd. I, I dig it. I dig it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And I'm a I'm a fan of the Oxford um, comma, by the way, the zero comma. So I'm with you on that. Um, but yeah, what to do with these red flags, as you mentioned, my upcoming book. But going back to why I got into writing um, or just publishing is um, uh, January 2019. I declared that month that I'm going to be a published author by the end of this year. And what, what prompted me, the impetus of that was, I'm from a small rural town in Southeastern Kentucky, and I don't know um, how it is there, but um, here and specifically in that area is stricken by the opioid crisis. Mm -hmm. And I was a victim of that, a childhood victim of that. My parents were addicted to, to opioids. And I, I wanted 
to write something for them and also to my children to let them know that it doesn't matter what their current circumstance is. And if, you know, if there's not an example in front of them in terms of what it is that they want to be in life, they can still become whomever they want in life and go oh. wherever they want. So that was the, you know, the, the catapult for that. And after that, you know, the rest is pretty much history, just wanting to leave a legacy for my children and also leaving them something tangible in terms of uh, the importance of self-love. You know, my second book, I Am Loved and I Love Me. I Am Loved and I Love Me. <gasps> yes. <laughs> Yes, yes. So there's that. Um, those are just short affirmations that are that are easy to remember uh, for children ages zero to eight. And I've even had adults buy this for their friends, their older friends, um, mm -hmm. who just maybe need a little reminder. I think that what you're doing is so fantastic. I mean, hearing hearing stories like that, Matika, where you where the odds were stacked against you. Right in your childhood, the odds are stacked against you. You know, uh, trauma happens to you know everybody. Let's face that. Um, but the reality is, is that some people's trauma is more significant and and more impactful. Yet it feels like you know you're in a place now, despite hardships. Don't get me wrong. I don't I don't want to paint the picture that your life is a is a fairy tale. How did how did you come to that place? How did you not go down the same path? Because that's a really big choice that we often you know that people need to make. Will I be the same as my parents with addiction, with abuse, with their trauma? How did you decide or when did you decide, maybe both, to, to not carry that legacy, to make your a different legacy for your own? Yes, you know, funny enough, even though that was going on in the home, my parents were still sticklers on education and they still, you know, in, instilled that in me. Um, they fostered a learning environment as well. You know, even with my my dad, um, you know, correcting my grammar and introducing me to bigger words, you know, mm. increasing my vocabulary. And with my mother, you know, um, and this is the other thing too, the funny thing about addiction is that, you um, it doesn't discriminate. So even wow. though my mother, she, you know, she held um, a Bachelor of Science degree in sociology and psychology. And, um, but addiction, it, it's a disease. Yeah. So it doesn't matter, you know. But anyway, you know, she would even, if I asked her, hey, mom, I remember one time asking her, how do you spell chocolate? And she said, go look it up. Get the dictionary and go look it up. So they always encouraged that. Um, yeah, they were a big proponent of uh, education will get you far in life. Mm. And, and that's how, yeah, that's how um, I just, you know, just became just a lover of academia, really. Oh, I love that. And and what I'm also hearing you saying through that conversation is, and I'm wondering whether or not you're open to having this conversation, certainly let me know, because, because when you say that, you know, addiction doesn't discriminate, I think this is really important because, you know, I often talk about like body shame does not discriminate. Um, Self-hate doesn't discriminate. There's this idea that if you look a certain way, then you will automatically like yourself. If you... Yeah fit into society's norm of your body shape, the, 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 the size, the color, the, the whatever, then you're going to fit into a certain um, mold to which you would be immune to, mm -hmm. to hardships in your life, immune to self-hate. And I think with addiction, I'm, I'm recovering from, like I've recovered from bulimia. So having that sense of, of food addiction that I've had, and I know that a lot of my listeners have that as well, um, Talking to that piece about, you know, about that, that addiction, I know it's not necessarily your expertise with addiction, but, you know, certainly your experience around, like, how is it that, like, what's your thought thinking about the fact that it doesn't discriminate and that it's a disease? Yes, because, you know, and I even write about this because I did a little bit of research. Um, I, I write about this in, in my blog where I speak to, um, I survived my parents' opioid addiction. Um, yeah. And it's on, it's on my website. And it, it's because it's so potent. And it replaces uh, different um, different aspects of your brain that causes you to say, you know what, I like this, I like this feeling, and it is, and it's so powerful. It's even, it's, it's more powerful than um, than anything that we can get, you know, um, just like through our family or going shopping, different things like that, other outlets that that brings us that type of dopamine. It, it replaces that in a significant amount, mm -hmm. and I, that that's how it's able to um, to take over one's mind, uh, regardless of what your economic status is or where you are um, um, in society, what class you're in. Yeah, and and I think that that's so true as well. You know, in in my experience, both like the drug and alcohol addiction, even in 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 my younger days, it may seem like a rite of passage where young people. I don't know if it, what the culture's like from where you're from, but 
from, you know, in Australian culture, it's a rite of passage for young, young people in their late teens, their early 20s to just be a binge drinker. It's very common mm. to just get what we would call trashed every weekend, um, you know, Thursday through Sunday, uh, and then mm. spend a couple of days recovering before getting trashed again. That was such a common thing. Um, and, and a lot of a lot of people that I know still do that. It's still a very socially acceptable kind of addiction to just get drunk every other day. Very, very normal. And what I notice for myself is that I always turn to those things, be that food, be that, be that drugs, be that alcohol, because, because there was pain inside of me that I wasn't looking at facing, you know, like I I wasn't. I love this and I want to know more about your book because there are red flags for me. You know, they're, they're indicators within myself to say, mm-hmm. hey, something's going on. I'm reaching out yeah. instead of reaching in. Like they're, they're mm-hmm. alarm bells. Tell me about your book. Tell me when I think of the word red flags, um, yes. they, you know, they're alarm bells. They're like, you know, stop signs, slow down. They're, they're warning signs. Tell me about your book. What what does this mean? What is Red Flags? What does it mean for you in the way in which you have come to create it? Yes, Luna, that's a perfect segue. I like how you piece that together uh, because you talked about your, your searching outward for what you need internally. And that's what my, my book speaks to. You know, I was, um, I'm a private person. <laughs> All of my friends know this and my, you know, my peers know this. However, um, when I set out to live out my purpose, I, I understood that you have to be transparent in order to, to do that. Mm. And part of that was after, um, I'm a recent divorcee, mm. <laughs> and um, while I was going through the process toward the, you know, the, the beginning of the proceedings, and um, I had a message on my heart that I knew I had to get out. It was kept mm. back, and it, it just kept knocking and knocking. And that was this book. That was this book because um, the re- this book addresses not only other people's red flags that we should be aware of and understanding why why is it that we still choose people who have red flags? Why are we collecting them <laughs> instead of leaving them on the table? Yeah. Why do we do that? But we do it, right? Or we have done it. Certainly do. And then, yes. And also, I, I also do the mirror check in my book as well because I also want us to look at what are our own red flags that yeah. we have. And so I had to do that. You know, I, I tell my girlfriends this. Um, that during this period of the divorce and I've grown exponentially just out of wisdom you have. in terms of wisdom. Yeah. yeah 10 years, girl. <laughs> and um, <laughs> girl, those red flags, my internal ones speaks to exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. I grew up, I was conditioned to be a codependent and I didn't know that until early in my twenties, Luna, I did not know that until then. And so that's something that I had to address because I was looking outward for that love and that acceptance that, that you talk about a lot on your podcast. Oh, I, th- there's so many juicy questions that I want, I want to ask you. <laughs> um, I'm like, my brain's going, Brr! the first one is you keep sneak peeking. I keep getting like the top of your book. Show it to me. Like yes. a little bit higher. give me a little bit higher. I want to see the, yeah. Yeah. Unlocking healthy relationships from the penance within. Oh, oh, I yeah. love this. Thank you. That's the first one. I'm like, I need to see. The second one is, um, who 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 is your audience for it? You've written obviously children's books before. Is this a yeah. is this a children's book? Is it a teenage? Like, what age group? Obviously, it'll be true for everybody. Um, like your mm-hmm. children. So, but what age group? What's the demographic that you're looking for in that book? Absolutely, this book. I'm like, man, I wish I had this when I was growing up. Yeah, you, you mentioned it, young adults on that, really teenagers on that, because if no one's told them this before, they don't know it. And I would, I would like, I would have liked to have, a, to have had a blueprint of some sort to kind of, to dissect things and better understand myself and also others. Mm. And yeah, so it's really for young adults on up. And yeah, this is, you're right. This is my first book for non, you know, non-children, right? <laughs> for us, yeah. Big not, not a children's book, you know, it, like a children's yes. book is, is typically illustrated with the simple messages, whereas this is this is a uh, you know more robust in terms of details and whatnot. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yes, I I think it's so necessary. And and when you say you you wish that you had a book like this, I remember when I was writing my book, Perfectly Imperfect, and mm-hmm. it, what it said at the top of my page every single time I opened the document was. Luna, write the book that you needed. Yes, I love that. And as I'm going to come back into those red flags, because I want to talk more about that, you you spoke into the courage to follow your heart. I know that a lot of 
my listeners and the people that follow me have a song in their heart, in their heart that they want to sing. You know, they, they have this calling, but they're so afraid. They're so afraid of, of failing, of falling, of moving away from the old thing. They're afraid to leave that relationship to become a divorcee because there's this idea of who they're meant to be, an idea of how they should be. And I'm really getting the feeling that that's probably part of your story too from that codependency of like, well, no, I'm, there's a tick boxes. Well, I don't want to have three kids under, how many, three under three? Did you say three under five? Three under five, three under five, three four, under two, five. and one. <laughs> Hectic. I now do the math. It's pretty hard to have three under three, but you could do it. Um, yes. <laughs> possible, but not <laughs> three under five is hectic. But to sit there and go, cool, well, now I'm a divorcee. And, and to, to go into the unknown of that, what's, what was your experience like of that, to have the courage to decide to follow your heart? Because that's it's hectic. And I, I know it for myself, and I know that so many of my listeners wish that they had the courage to do that. What, what has that experience been like for you? Yes, for me, it was about acknowledging the truth, acknowledging what season you're in and also what season your partner is in. Mm-hmm. And then after that, it's choosing you. Sometimes we forget to choose ourselves. And that was, that was the biggest factor for me was choosing me. Uh, but, you know, and it goes back to, to that accountability check as well. Um, and, or the mirror check that I should say as well, because you have to understand that you can only control what you can control. You can't love someone into loving you. You can't ask them, hey, can you see me? I, I know you, can you see me? They already see you. <laughs> you have to understand that we're all on our own journeys. Yeah. And sometimes whenever we're t- talking about our partners, sometimes their journey that they're on, that next chapter, that next season, unfortunately it doesn't include you. And that's very difficult, a very difficult pill to swallow because you're like, hey, we built this together. Yeah. I thought that we we're going to go to the long haul. And sometimes that's not always the case. I, yeah. For, for me, and, and similarly, I, I, I'm not technically a divorcee, but I was with my partner for 10 years mm-hmm. and we oh, wow. split. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, and all our assets were shared, everything apart from a bit of paper. We didn't have any children, but we certainly had pets and assets and everything needed to be divided. So, you know, yeah. it to me it's a divorce that was mm-hmm. that was the experience of that and to understand i think that there's a notion within society that suggests that that relationships are only successful when they end in death mm. and that sounds a bit hectic but think about it you know if you've got a couple that have been together for 50, 50, 50 years we celebrate that we do but we don't ask if they're happy we don't ask if if they are fulfilled, if they are living their heart's purpose, we don't ask if they bring out, if they still bring out the best in one another and are they growing in the same direction in the same pace or have they settled? Have they gone, well, it's too hard to leave. Right. Would I ever find anybody else? What am I going to do without them? Very often the comfort zone keeps people where they are and, and I think that having a having a a consciousness shift around that, that relationships, when they end, they have served their purpose. Just like you said, you built this thing together. They have served what they needed to for that period of time. A reason, season, a lifetime is that, you know, you you hear that quote, people come into your life for a reason, a season or a lifetime. And Mm -hmm. despite it being sad, I think that if we saw relationships as a purpose built thing, you know, that we have relationships to learn. <laughs> and once we've learned, yes, it's done. And I think that we hold on for so long and then it becomes really toxic, right? Because now we resent each other. Well, you're not being this for me. You're not being this for me. You're not being mm. this for me. It was blissful before, but maybe that's because it's run its it's it's run its time. Yeah. Mm. You know, yes. mm-hmm. and it's sad, but the transition of realizing that we are either green and growing or ripe and rotting, you know, like we need to continue to expand. It's the nature of the universe. It's how we, it's how we grow. So I, I just love everything that you're about. Tell me more about the codependency, because I think that that's something, again, to me, self, low self-esteem and codependency are bedfellows, you know, yes. 
people pleaser. That is something I don't know if it's a term that get clearly it does. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 because that's part of codependency as well. It is. Can you speak into into more of that? What what does codependency mean for those people who may not know the term? Um, what are some of the red flags of codependency? Absolutely. And before I dive into that, I just want to say you've just been screaming my book, that whole <laughs> that whole message before and screams everything that's in my book. Right. But yeah, for those for those who don't know about codependency, um, it's it's you feeling overly obligated to accommodate others. You're putting everyone else's needs before yours. You're a people pleaser. You're an over, you give too much, you overextend. That's you. If Luna and I were talking and she's telling me about her problem, I'm like, oh, wow. And then at the end of the conversation, it, be, it goes from what Luna's going through to, well, how can we, what can we do to solve this issue? Mm. And, and, you're, and you're doing that. I would do that for people ahead of my own priorities. Yeah, I would overgive, you know, financially with my time, and then I had, I would there. What was self care? I had no idea because I hadn't even stopped to breathe, to mm-hmm. pause, to say, what does Martika, what does Martika need? Never did that. Yeah. So what I'm hearing there is that you know that that codependency there is that it's almost it's almost and depending on varying degrees, everything's a spectrum. It's almost a complete disregard of self. For the sake of others. Yes, for the sake of others. It's hyper empathy. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's the thing that a lot of the clients that I work with, actually pretty much everyone, are so generous, are so giving, are so loving, and they're afraid that, that that's going to change. And the reality is I want to keep my clients as loving, generous, beautiful, because they're so kind-hearted. They're so yeah. giving and they're so empathetic. They feel the energy. I, I, you know, grew up with, with okay. alcohol abuse in my family, right? So mm-hmm. similar kind of deal. As a, as a really empathetic person that's also codependent and the people pleaser, I could read the room from, from the scent, of that <laughs> one noise that I could hear, you know, in the garage. I'd be like, oh, okay, you cool. Can feel it. I could feel it. Yes, me. Yeah. and now I need to do something different. So the adapt, like we had to adapt, right? Is that is that similar to you? You have to kind of adapt to the environment. That's mm-hmm. kind of what's caused that codependency. Rather than rely on me, I need to, I need to keep keep the peace and not rock the boat. Is that similar to what? you've experienced do you think yeah that yeah that's one aspect of it was that um feeling like I had to be the change to, to like you said to make everything level and, and peaceful and and also um wanting to be loved to genuinely be loved because whenever there's addiction in the home there you know there's not enough of it or I didn't sense enough of it being poured into me and then so mm-hmm. I'm seeking this love and acceptance from everyone I mean my parents love me no shadow, you know without a shadow of a doubt yeah however you know with with that it with the addiction you know that becomes more of a baby to them you know feeding that and so um you know different things you know get left out for Martika as a child mm-hmm. you know um in terms you know the finances you know we didn't have discretionary di- income it was it was gone so um not getting new clothes for back to school not getting new mm-hmm. shoes different things like that not be, you know my I talk about this in my book too in short you know just my 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 moments weren't celebrated as much yeah um, so yeah so just you know, they love me, of course, um, but, th- you know, it could have been enhanced a little bit more <laughs> in terms yeah, of the I, I, think, I think that's a really important piece too because if anyone listening who I speak to clients who say to me, but I had a really good childhood. Like my parents were fine. There was no big things. There was no overt trauma. There was no, you know, stuff going on. So then therefore they think, well, then I shouldn't be codependent or I shouldn't have trauma or I should, I should be grateful that, you know, they should all over themselves Um, in this sense that they, they have this expectation that it wasn't that bad. So therefore, I want to highlight for everybody, for myself and you included, because I know that it's always uh, remembering and it's a journey for all of us to to really be mindful of the fact that you don't need to have gone through a lot of stuff for your parents to not have been there for you. Your parents can be loving. Your parents can be beautiful. Your parents can be wonderful and kind and gorgeous to you. That's a wonderful thing. And they still could have not given you what you emotionally needed. Yes, that's it. Because 
you can't teach what you don't know. If you're, and let's face it, societally, systemically, most of us don't know how to deal with our own emotions. And that's why I think your work is so important. <laughs> yes. Because, because we don't know how to, like, we learn algebra at school, but we don't know how to deal with fear. Like, yeah. it's something that we face every day, that the human emotions and our thoughts in our mind are the two things that the feelings and thoughts are the two things that destroy most of us. Yes. And most people at this point in time don't know how to deal with their So how could they possibly teach their kids? Even if you're, that's what I'm saying, like even if for, for your listeners, my listeners, if you haven't experienced alcohol, drug abuse, trauma in your family, I want you to know that most, most parents were not equipped, are not equipped to be able to give you the emotional need, emotional to meet your emotional needs. That's what I'm saying. And I think that that's important. That's why we need to do the healing. Like the buck stops with me. That part. Yeah. Like yeah. for you, you now have three kids. How, how are then, how do you, Matika, how do you balance that? I know that I've got clients who will say to me, oh my God, I have kids, but I'm still going through my own shit. I'm still healing. I'm still trying to figure it out. What would you give that answer to them? How, how do you still be human, still figuring it out, not have the answers, still be dealing with your own thoughts and your own emotions while trying to instill in your kids that they can be whoever they want to be? Yeah, for me, uh, one thing that I've that I started doing with uh, with Penelope, Penelope's my oldest, she's four, is I started with her uh, because I didn't get this as a child, was the affirmation aspect. So on a routine basis, she gets to make them up as she goes uh, now, but she'll she'll say her affirmations every day. And Hugh, he's two, and he'll say one or two, you know, I'm smart, I'm handsome, and then I have them give themselves a kiss in the mirror. Love it. I love you. <laughs> yeah. So just little nuggets like that. And also uh, I, I want them, I, I never want them to take on my emotions. Yeah. So part, like you talked about the managing of emotions part, I'm, I'm something that we have to do for ourselves first is learn how to manage our own emotions. Um, I do let them see me feel, you know, that way they understand, okay, th th this is a series of emotions. Mom can't be happy all the time. Huh. Um, but I also, whenever they're going through something, I try to help them to understand what it is that they're feeling. You know, so sometimes if you, he's too, he's upset. I'm like, do you need a hug? He's like, yeah, <laughs> with tears in his eyes because he needed a hug, but he didn't know how to express that. Yeah. So just try to help them navigate at a young age. Um, because like you said, the, the fear component, being afraid to, to fail and fell forward and not being able to manage our emotions, those two factors, I believe as well, um, cause us to get in, our, get in our own way. Yeah, big time. And I think that that's, you know, that's super important. Some, some of the inner child work stuff that I do with, with, with my clients is around being the parent that you never had for yourself. Yes, that's it. Mm -hmm. for, for you, you know, and I love that you get to do this. You get to now teach, like, because kids often don't know. They don't know how, like, they don't know what the feeling is. They don't know how to express it. They don't know. It's overwhelming. I mean, it's overwhelming for us as adults sometimes. <laughs> Actually, a lot so of the time. Because it's like we have this presumption that just because we've, we've aged, then we're going to have all of a sudden figured out how to deal with it. But the reality is we still don't, which is why people turn to drugs, alcohol, um, mm -hmm. sex addiction, scrolling, binging, watching, shopping. Mm -hmm. Yeah whatever to distract them from the pain. But if we were able to ask for what we need, Hugh saying, you know, do you need a hug? And then he'll learn as time yes. goes on, oh, when I get that feeling, what I need is a hug. Yes. So, and it might be I'm going to get it from mum or I might get it from me. I'm going to kiss it. Yes. Kiss Enjoy your own company. Right. Yes, embrace yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I love it. You mentioned before around <laughs> you mentioned before around you not necessarily knowing as, as you were codependent and growing up as a people pleaser, you didn't know what self-care was. You didn't know what it was to look after you. Do you know now what, you know, obviously it's always a forever learning. What self-care and so, like that kind of like to you? 
Yes, you know, and I actually, I, I specific, specifically list and categorize self-care in my book. It's, a, it's an interactive book as well, everyone. Uh, so, right. you know, you get to learn and apply, read and apply. Um, but yes, yeah, so now what I do, um, and I incorporate my kids too in my self-care. So I'm big on connecting with nature and they're very outdoorsy themselves. So we'll do hikes or we'll do bike rides. Um, I'm a stickler for being in the gym. Um, I used to uh, run track, you know, back at high school school and also in college for a small stint. So um, working out, you know, getting those good endorphins and keeping your body, you know, um, this in a healthy form. Um, so that journaling, that's very therapeutic, as you know. <laughs> so yeah, those are just some of the things. And I'm um, just remembering just to um, just to have fun. You know, my children, you know, remind me of that. So whenever they just want to stop and if it's just to tell, you know, a quirky joke of some sort, then I'll stop what I'm doing to give them my undivided attention. So different things like that I, I do. And just at the end of the day, never taking myself too seriously and having humility. <laughs> There's a beautiful story and I, and I can't remember who it's attributed. So if anybody can, if anybody can attribute, let me know, give me a comment or whatever. There's a beautiful story of, um, Two, two presidents or prime ministers are, are having a conversation, two leaders, and, uh, and, and a staff member bursts into the room, you know, boss, 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 how, I'm panicking, I'm panicking. And, and, and the, the leader says, says to the staff member, remember, rule number five. Oh, yeah, rule number five, you're right, leaves. This happens five or six times throughout, throughout the meeting <laughs> with the two leaders. And, and finally the other leader says, i got to know, what's rule number five? He goes, don't take yourself too seriously. <laughs> he goes, well, what, what's one, one through four? There isn't one. It's just rule number five. <laughs> number five. You know, like, I think it's so easy, and particularly when, you know, shit's hitting the fan. Bad things mm. happen, right? Like, you know, the world is in, is, in a, is in a rough place. We do have divorce. We do have death. We do have hardship. When we say don't take yourself too seriously, I think that for me what that means is not dismiss or minimize your pain um mm -hmm. but to understand that there's a lot of joy and very often most of the things that we're worried about never actually happen because they're just in our head uh, that's in the book yes <laughs> so good yes the hypotheticals the yeah yeah we make we make stuff up in our head all the time right yeah Mm -hmm. So for you getting into nature, journaling, um, you know, not keeping things light as well is, is something that's super important for, for your self-care and staying active. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's true. You know, I'm, I, body positivity is, is part of my jam and, and a big part of what I do. And, yes. and so a relevant of size, shape, age, ability, what I want to encourage everybody is just move however you want to. That's it. Yes. And just move. Like it, mm -hmm. it doesn't even like, it doesn't need to be exercise. Like got to go to the gym. If you love the gym, like you do Matika, go to the gym. It's great. Mm -hmm. Lift the heavy weights, run on the treadmill. If that's your jam, then do it. But if it's dancing, if you just want to put on classic eighties music and dance around your house for 20 minutes, do that. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if you want to take up ribbon dancing uh, or, you know, roller skating or I don't, mm -hmm. I don't care what it is, just, right. <laughs> just to whatever ability you can, even if you're, you know, even if you're bed bound, can you lift your arms up if that's the case, you know, yes. fi find a way to do that. Mm -hmm. Magic, magic. Coming back to your book for a moment, is there any, and I didn't, I, I'm putting you on the spot here, is there any excerpt, anything that you could read that you particularly love from it that you might want to share maybe around codependency or around any of that? Is there any bit that you might like to read out from your book that? Yes, yes, I would like to read something. Um, you mentioned, let's see which part I can read. And just everyone watching at home, I've totally put my teacher on the spot here. I did not <laughs> <laughs> brief her that I would be asking that question because I didn't know myself. <laughs> no, yes. You know what? I can read something from Liberation if you want me to. Yeah, please. I'd love my it. Chap please. Yeah, my chap chapter on Liberation because I'm big on that. Set yourself free, everyone, right? Ah, oh, hallelujah. All right, so here it goes. At the end of the day, inner peace is everything and nothing should interfere with it. Protect it at all costs. 
everything must be balanced in order for us to be centered mentally, physically, financially, spiritually, etc. Oh. You have you have to save yourself. You have to come to terms with what season you're at in your life and fully commit to it. So if it's your selfish season, let it be just that. Taking the time to figure yourself out. You'll know when you're on the brink of your next season because you'll feel complete. You'll stand erect in who you are. And to top it off, everyone around you will see it. It's a beautiful feeling to be one with yourself wholeheartedly. I'm rooting for you. And how do you save yourself, you ask? Self-reflect, understand your vision, dive into how you will improve yourself for you. Mm. And lastly, place your time and energy into building and molding your craft. Boom. <laughs> Don't we all need to read this book? Don't you reckon? Comes out it comes out September 30, by the way, Barnes and Noble, Amazon, etc. Um, mm-hmm. please go check that out. That was that was amazing. Thank you for sharing. I'm so glad I asked. Because you know what comes through through for me there is that particularly from a history of low self-esteem, codependency, and people pleasing, mm. there is this notion that we're waiting for someone else to save us. Girl. <laughs> yeah. Isn't there? It's it is. like it, it, and and still for myself, even after my my split, uh we, we split, we were still madly in love. There it just we 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 wanted different things in our relationship. Same, same. There you go. So it was yeah, yeah. So it was particularly difficult because I had to end something that I love with someone I loved. It's not like I stopped loving him. I it's not like I wanted to. I didn't want to be with him anymore. I desperately wanted to be with him, but we wanted different things. So, so I, I couldn't, what I kept finding, and it's only, it's been about two years now, going on two years, um, is that there was this secret part of myself, you know, all the little, the truths that we hold for ourselves. Oh, yeah. Likely to share with other people. Yes. Um, <laughs> I was holding on this hope that, that he would come along and save the day. That he would that he would come and and say no I I'm willing to do what it takes no I love you I I want you I choose you I I want to be with you and mm-hmm. I'm, I'm gonna fight for you that's <laughs> that's what I said <laughs> that is <isn't> wanted <laughs> fight for me tell me that I'm worthy tell me that I'm valuable yes. Wow. I'm excited to have to say about this because for me, what I realized through that process is that everything that I desired from him, I needed Mm -hmm. to give to me. Yeah. You know it already, right? It's that. Mm -hmm. And and I believe this is true for everything. Everything that we seek in someone else, in jobs, in titles, in money, in relationships, in, in the body that we want, everything that we seek externally is what we need to give to ourselves. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that we're an island. It doesn't mean that we never reach out for help. But the reality is we are with ourselves 24-7 and we can never leave us. Mm -hmm. But other people can, and it's not being cynical. It's just being realistic in the sense that even your bestest, even your partner, their job, it's not their job to make you happy. That's your job, right? (laughs) Luna, you are talking my entire book. (laughs) We may have written the same book. (laughs) We may have written the same book. (laughs) Look, the universe brought us together for a reason, okay? I'm really big on that. (laughs) No Uh happenstance. (laughs) Yes, you know what? I talk about, even on my TikToks, but I talk about in my book about unconditional happiness. I speak on that, about how you, that's what we all, in order for us to fully be liberated in life, we have to attain that for ourselves. Mm. You know, something that no one can give you because it's here. And no one can take it away because it's here. So we we all have to attain that. Absolutely. Yeah, and you were saying that in, in the in the part that you read about you treasure that inner peace. Like that above all is your purpose, right? Like I think that mm. so many people, and even even for yourself, you know, you're in the construction industry, which we haven't even talked about, which is I'm not surprised. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um but I'm curious about it. That that we look externally for for this for the purpose that if i if i write the book then i'll find my purpose if i if i do the, my dream work then i'll be happy and it's it's a really tempting 
idea. Mm -hmm. And I've said this to people with myself, I do things that I love. Like I feel honored and, and, you know, you for yourself with, with authorship and what you're doing here is that Mm -hmm. I get to do things that I love. Um, But if you took that away from me, I'm still going to be okay. Yes. Mm-hmm. because as long as we rel- we put our happiness in the hands of things outside of us, mm-hmm. it is conditional, as you just said. Yes. So it has to be unconditional, which means it comes internally, right? Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree with that. And then, too, is when you talk about the purpose factor, I talk about this in my book, is um, that the longer that you hold on to those external things to bring you happiness – the more distance is created between you and your purpose. Yeah. So you have, you, you have to have that, that journey of self-discovery that I speak about in my book. And I was able to have that during the, uh, the, the divorce as the proceedings were coming along and, and also more so too, whenever they got to go spend time with dad over the summer. Yes. <laughs> yes um, because we have a very healthy co-partnership and we still love each other. Like you said, you and your mate, you know, or ex-mate, you all still love each other. It's, we do, we still respect each other. Um, yeah. We love each other. I will say that. Um, he's on my launch team too, for my book. So. Yay! <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yeah. So we still support each other and encourage us all of those things. Um, but um yeah um yeah the, uh yeah you have to um you have to have that, that journey of self-discovery and i was able to do that like i said during that time and really pour into me really understand what are what does martika like what do i like mm. and what do i not like and that also afforded me the opportunity which is important for everyone is to have those boundaries in place but in order for you to have boundaries and to enforce them you have to know what they are so understanding how other people make you feel actions that make you feel a certain type of way if you don't like something okay that's a potential boundary for you that you need to implement and enforce yeah what are your non-negotiables so the list kind of goes on from there but you really have to be concrete in who you are um, from that regard so that you're able to respect yourself and what makes you feel certain ways I couldn't agree more. I think that the very first step, if someone says to me, how do I love myself? It's like, well, you have to get to know you. Yes. <laughs> and, and it sounds bizarre. You know, we talk about love at first sight. Have you ever fallen in love with a stranger? And, and yes, that does happen. People do. But the reality is, and there's a, there's a paragraph in my book, um, and I hope, you, I hope you don't mind me using a little bit of profanity here, um, when I'm like, you don't really know somebody until you've, you've until you've smelt their shit. Oh. You yes. and and literally and metaphorically, like to me, if you're getting married and and you haven't walked into the bathroom after they've had a movement, <laughs> you don't know each other well enough yet. <laughs> like there's, you're still getting to know each other, right? You're, getting to know each other. you're still hiding your bodily functions from one another. Yes. And if if you're hiding your bodily functions from one another because you're in the honeymoon phase. There's a whole bunch other internal shit that you're not dealing with yet. That's it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and <laughs> so, but you have to get to know your own shit too. You have to know mm. what, are, what are my triggers? What, you know, what are my own red flags? As you say in the book, like yes. where, where am I being toxic to myself? And I talk about this heavily. I was in a long-term abusive, toxic relationship with myself. Mm. I hated me. I self-harmed. I, the abuse that I gave to myself in my mind and sometimes out loud was disgusting and awful. No one ever treated me as badly as what I treated me. Wow. Mirror check. Wow. You know? And mm. if I'm allowing the one person that I live with 24-7 to do that, the one person that I have the most intimacy with, which is me, yeah. then of course I'm going to be letting other people in my world treat me like shit. That part. Because we need to set the boundary for ourselves. You're so right. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. we did write the same <laughs> book. I'm excited about it. <laughs> we got to do something together <laughs> as our relationship builds. I, I, I love so. it. Yes. <laughs> Such a beautiful thing. And if anybody watching and listening, if you have ideas about how my teacher and I need to hang out more frequently, <laughs> Make it happen. Make it happen. Yes, please. And thank you. Oh my, yeah. So much that you spoke there. Um, Oh my goodness. So much to unpack there. Yeah. (laughs) Sometimes that's what it's like. It's like, 
there's 12,000 different bits coming out of us because I think that that's right, that the the red flags for ourselves are huge Mm -hmm. Um, because if we're not seeing them in ourselves, if we're not seeing them... um, and addressing them within ourselves, how on earth can we can we ever attempt to do it for someone else? Because yeah. because we're constantly crossing our own boundaries. Mm-hmm. Tell me when you you know you, you talked about that that your divorce and the proceedings that happened allowed you get you know offered you the opportunity to be able to self reflect. Do you think that was the catalyst? Do you think this big potentially traumatic thing? Were you already on the path towards that? Like how did this big change in your life push you towards that I think I I think it was the former I think it was the catalyst to that uh, because sometimes you something so crazy has to happen in order for you to kind of get your wake-up call mm. in terms of you know maybe I haven't been doing it right the, the, you know this entire time and because it can't be and I talk about this in my book it can't be that it's everyone else <laughs> and that even in your relationship that, you know, they're the problem person and you're perfect, Patty. I talk about it, that in my book. It can't be that. Yeah. You you both make it happy together and you both bring friction in the relationship as well. So it's what did you contribute? Mm. And, you know, and I know for me, uh, sneak peek into my book, one of the things is that, you know, I expected certain at certain times for people to show up how I showed up for them yeah. because I went out of my way for them, for example. And it's no, and, and mind you, I'm a still, I'm an altruistic giver, but from that regard, I'm like, yeah, you know, I, I but I did, and it doesn't work that way. So had I had boundaries, mm. that wouldn't have been a thing. And, yeah. and, and had we not been chasing love through giving? Mm. Yes. Because I think that so many of us do that, even, even when we have a kind heart, we're doing it, mm. but there's also... Uh, to say that there's an ulterior motive makes it sound creepy and awful um, because it's still loving and kind, but it's actually because there's a lack with inside of us, right? Mm-hmm. It's I always say it's not what we do, it's why we do it. Yes, yeah. So, so self-care sometimes is sitting on the couch eating a bag of potato chips. Sometimes that's self-harm. And it's... It's not what I'm doing, it's why I'm doing it. Am I doing it to shove away the pain or am I doing it because yum potato chips, <laughs> right? Am I doing it free from, free from guilt and love and just enjoying my life because we live in a world where potato chips exist and, and thank God for that? Or am I doing it because I hate myself? And it's the same with the giving. Am I giving because, because I genuinely want to share and and want to help this person or is there something going on with inside of me where I'm hoping that they will respond in the same way when I need it and you may not even know that as you you came to discover you didn't even know that that was happening until you expected them to give back in the same way Mm -hmm. you're like oh hang on but I did that for you which Mm -hmm. in the first place I mean when, when anyone says that to me but I did it for you. It's like, well, did you do it so I would give it? Right. Really? Like, <laughs> and it's not giving. Exactly. <laughs> I noticed something, Matika, um, around people pleasing, around being nice. I had this experience that I discovered for myself where I was, <laughs> I was dating somebody for a few months Mm-hmm. Um, and things were moving very, very slowly. It was, I, I have unconventional relationships, so it wasn't a sexual relationship at that point in time, mm-hmm. but it was, right. it was physically intimate in terms of cuddling and touching and holding hands and that kind of gotcha. stuff. And, you know, all that jazz for a few months only to find out that they were just being nice. Uh- <laughs> <laughs> that they, that they just didn't want to rock the boat, that they just wanted to, that they just, they just, they, they were just trying to be nice and not hurt yeah. my feelings. And you can't do that. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's unkind, right? Sometimes, yeah. very often, nice is unkind mm-hmm. and it's dishonest. It is. It is. And what it ends up doing and what, what ended up happening in this circumstance, um, you know, she, she was feeling conver- um, coercion towards me. So about me, she oh. felt like I was coercing her into being more intimate in the relationship because I thought it was consensual, mm. but she did not. So then in that process, 
I made her, she, sorry, she made me a perpetrator. Wow. What, mirror yeah. check. <laughs> yeah, mirror check, right? In the sense that, like, when we do kind things for people, and I want to say nice because I think it's more appropriate, nice things for someone, mm-hmm. and we have some kind of underlying expectation, we then inadvertently make them the bad guy when they don't yeah. give it back in the same way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Which is unfair. <laughs> it's very, you know, it's unfair, Luna. And and you know how I talked about that earlier, how I would do that? I only did that in my relationship. So with my relationship mm-hmm. with their dad, because I, I, you know, you love this person. So yeah, you're going to bend over backwards for this person. And do, what, what do you need? When we go get you the moon and bring it back to you? I'll be back by noon. Like, what do you need? Yeah. <laughs> and then expecting them to bring me, bring me Mars, you know, next week and him not doing it and then getting mad about it, you know? Yeah. So it can't be that. My boundary should have been like, I'm not doing that. <laughs> oh, I'm going to go bring you the moon because yeah. I want to. That part and not expecting anything. Yeah. Yes. Expectations is one of those really insidious things that's, I mean, I continue to find very difficult I mm-hmm. to, to not have expectations on other, from other people. Like that's a, that's a tricky thing. Do you have any experience with that around, around around lessening the expectations of other people or being able to oh, give yeah. really do you have any experience around that of maybe what can help myself and yes list? oh yeah what I've done is um I think once you start with the the bar on the floor that's what you should do because once you've had the bar on the floor for expectations all people can do then is exceed those expectations because they're on the floor yeah <laughs> And that's what's helped me. Um, and, and, you know, and then to um, just also that I've always lived with this. And I'll talk about this in my book about how I've always operated that no one owes me anything. Yeah. So really no one owes you anything. Oh. But, na- but now, now I apply that to other people. So now I know that I don't owe other people anything either. When before, that is how I operated. Oh. They have this certain title in my life. So I do owe it to them, even though they didn't do it for me. But that's because they don't owe me anything. Yeah, I would ensure that I still met that for them. Ah, I love it. Yeah, Yeah, we can never do that. (laughs) It's a red flag of codependency, isn't it? I owe you everything, but you don't owe me anything. Oh, no, 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 no. Like we become a martyr. Like, no, oh, you don't have to do that for me. They're like, I shut up. Just let me do the thing. (laughs) I love you talking about the bar on the floor. And I would love some distinctions from you if you have them. and, And we can we can workshop it around. With the bar being on the floor in terms of expectation, what's the difference between an expectation and standards? Because for me, I know that, you know, not expecting people to make me happy, not expecting people to do things for me, great. In the past, there's a shady area there for low self-esteem and codependency because what that means is that I don't have any standards. Mm. It's okay for them to, um, you know, for me to ask. I remember in my previous relationship for 10 years, For 10 years, and he's a beautiful man, don't get me wrong, but for 10 (laughs) years, um, I just wanted to come home one day to the house being spotlessly clean with candles everywhere and rose petals and maybe a bath drawn and a romantic dinner planned. And I had asked for it on so many occasions. Mm -hmm. And it never happened. In 10 years, Mm -hmm. it never happened, you know. And, And I would feel like moving forward into a relationship having somebody who has that kind of romantic ideas or, or is willing to do it because particularly when I've asked for it, it's not like I love language. It's what it is an acts of service, hundred percent. So how do, how do you define that difference between, well, I don't expect it of you, but I also have standards in terms of, I was going to say of what's expected. Mm-hmm. where's the dance for that do you think yeah you're right there is that gray area so for you for that example I think if you're in the dating scene that, that should be your deal breaker if you're not the over-the-top romantic kind of person then you're not the person for me because that's how I want to be loved and you yeah. can't give that to me so you're asking something of someone who they can't give that to you because that's not the way that they like to show love for you and they're oh. not going to do that even though you want them to so that's not your person <laughs> not your person. And for other people, aside from romantic types of situations, it's just about having boundaries. So if you, for example, you're a stickler on someone being on time, like a, an acquaintance, for example, and it's been, you give maybe have a three stacks, you're out type of rule. I mean, I, I, I'm, 
I'm big on showing grace because we're human who's perfect. Hello. Yeah. Um, and, and, but you, you know, you treat some situations like isolated events, right? Things happen, but if it's an habitual thing and they're just not respecting your time, then why would you respect their time and continue to um, agree to meet up with them, for example? Yes. So I think it's it's that of having boundaries because remember we already have that unconditional happiness, so no one's there to give it to yeah. us. Right? <laughs> yeah. It's just about having just about having realistic boundaries and about knowing what you want and going for those types of people, for example, characteristics and romantic endeavors, and just leaving it at that. It's easier said than done, I know, but yeah. if you really want that for yourself, then you have to be willing to wait as well for that particular person to be in your life. Oh, yeah, you, so much gold in that, Matika, so much gold, because what, what was really dropping in for me as you were talking is that there's a real sense of an expectation um, is that externalization of happiness that you do this for me to make me feel a certain way. Right. Whereas a standard is a boundary or, or around, around what's okay and what's not okay in my world. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for me, a standard would be that, that I'm with somebody who, who has a passion for something, who has opinions, you know, I, I don't want to be around yes people, right? I don't want someone to just... <laughs> acquiesce to all of my needs all the time that would mm -hmm. shit me so mm -hmm. you know someone for, for a passion for growth have a values match that would be a standard that I have mm -hmm. um but then to go into a relationship with somebody knowing full well that that isn't a standard of theirs and I say relationship in any form it could be romantic oh, yeah. whatever if I then continue a relationship with that person knowing full well as you say that they're going to show up late every time then yeah. then that's on me yeah <laughs> like I can keep getting the shits at them for being late but they're always late so I either decide to be in a relationship with them or not exactly that, it's that easy as you say unconditional happiness is the only place you find that is internal yes oh <laughs> girl I love it I love it Tell me, is there, is there anything else? If you, you know, if it, for the listeners out there, is there anything else? I feel like we could talk for four years, which is wonderful. I know, right? Is there anything <laughs> else that, you know, that you would love to share, a bit of knowledge, a bit of wisdom, a bit of something that you would love to give to the people that are listening around your work, around what you do, around your ethos mm -hmm. in life? Yes, my, my message um, as it's coming to me is just to, to be kind to yourself, be gentle to yourself, and pour into yourself. If there's something that I know we talked about, hey, there was a, a, a vision, you know, on my mind, um, a message in my heart, mm -hmm. if that's you as well, start start bringing that to life. Nice. Start just writing down step by step. And I even have, when you get my book, you'll have um, step by step how to do that and make a declaration to yourself that, hey, by X, Y, and Z, I will have accomplished this passion of mine. Yeah. Because like, as I said before, success is in all of us. Yeah. So just make sure that you're carrying out what it is that you foresee yourself doing in your life and go for it. Oh. Just love on you. Just love on you. That's it. Love on you. Yes. I, I, I there's, a, there's, an, there's a spiritual guide that I follow uh, called Matt Kahn and he, and he says, we always deserve more love, not less. Oh, yes. And so, like, love on you. I love that. Yeah, like, all that love that you're trying to get from somebody else by giving it, give it to you and see what happens. Be that for your person. Yeah, for yourself. Yeah. For yourself. And and that's the thing. You always then have more to give because the cup is always full. The cup is always full. And you know what? Last thing, all that you're seeking from everyone else, once you start to show that for you, you will attract what it is that you're looking for because yeah. people sense that they, oh, they sense that. And again, we could talk on and on, <laughs> but I just wanted to say that last thing. <laughs> yes. And thank you. I mean, thank you. As you say, we could talk on and on. And I think it's marvelous. There's, there's so much gold in our conversation for the people watching and listening at home. So thank you for everybody coming. You can follow you can follow Martika in lots of different places. I'm going to put everything in the show notes. So from um, TikTok, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, you know, you can subscribe to her newsletter as well, which I feel like will be a beautiful way to, to connect and follow. You can enter a giveaway as well because there's an entry link for a free book for one lucky listener. So that's on her Instagram, which is instagram.com forward slash Martika Chanel. As I said, I will put that in the, in the show notes as we go along. 
You, my dear, speaker of self-love and inspiration, what an absolute pleasure it is to have you here with us. Thank you so much. Thank Before, you. You're so welcome. Before we finish up, please just show us your book one last time, the latest book that's coming out by yeah, Martina Chanel, What to Do With These Red Flags. Yes. And there also, this also includes poetic excerpts as well from my To Myself With Love project that's also in the works. You also get some poetry gems as well. <laughs> I feel like you want to, there's probably three or four poems in my book that I've written. So it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Like, absolutely. I'm like, really, there's poetry in it. And I, I certainly put poetry in mine as well. So I think that that's just on point. Totally on point, girl. It's awesome. Awesome. So please, you know, pre-order, the, the pre-order sale is available at the moment. So you can go to Amazon, you can go to Barnes & Noble. Again, everything's going to be in the show notes. If you have listened, if you're following my ticker, if you haven't already, please go follow her. She is phenomenal, doing amazing stuff. And I highly recommend checking out the children's books as well. If you do have kids, particularly younger kids, I think that that's such an incredible opportunity to be able to help our kids our little ones to be able to build and grow and I'll certainly be sharing that with all my little uh little humans around the world that I know of I think that's an absolutely beautiful thing Matika it is an absolute pleasure thank you for being here thank you <laughs> thank you for joining us on another episode of more confidence with Luna Gaia Hope that you have gotten so much value out of our conversation here with Martika. Remember, her book is out September 30. And my book, Perfectly Imperfect, Your Complete Guide to Loving Yourself and Loving Your Body, is out October 1st. So go ahead and check out everyone in the show notes. It'd be absolutely wonderful to have you on my VIP list where you get previews and all that stuff to be able to get exclusive content before my book comes out on October 1st. Sending you so much love. Happy self-loving. Mm -hmm.